Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm. I'll be your host. And today I'm joined with my good friend, Doug Hagren. Hey, Doug. Yeah, another happy Friday to you, Kirk. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Well, this is good. It's Friday. We're getting close to the fourth. We're not quite there yet. Get another week uh, before that week. I always love the fourth week when it falls in the middle of the week because the first half of the week, some people take off. The other half of the week, some people take off. So you might as well just take off the whole week because no one's around. <laughs> so, or if you're one of those people that work in a, in a in a dark office with no human intervention, it's a great week for you because no one's interrupting you. So either way, whatever your whatever your work habits, uh, kudos for the, for that week. Um, yeah, let's let's dive right in. What's 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 new in the world? Well, uh, the most important news uh, is uh, Willie Mays died. Uh, rest in peace, Willie. Uh, unbelievable athlete. I remember watching as a kid, where uh, where that that unbelievable catch, you know, over his shoulder, running full speed, just phenomenal athlete. And the funny thing is, is, he did those all the time, but there was only one that they caught, and they just said, "Oh, we're going to keep replaying this one." But he did that all the time. The basket so, catch, the yeah. famous, bas- inf- you know, famous basket catch. Yeah, I mean, I I, I played outfield in, in in college, and I <laughs> no way I could do that. <laughs> it was just it was crazy. So, Kirk, did uh, you pl- did you play baseball in college for for your school? Uh, baseball and hockey, yeah. I did not know. I knew about the hockey. I did not know you were a baseball player. Very cool. Yeah, I don't brag about it too much. It's uh, nothing I mean, it's, to brag about. <laughs> not a, it's not. Well, no, I was a. Uh, I, I was. In, I played outfield, so I was a hitter. Like you okay, probably yeah. did clean the bases, but um, that's awesome. But yeah, it was fun. But uh, you know, it was wasn't D one. It was D three. So uh, yeah, still, we, it, it was a good beer drinking team. Did, so did you know that only one percent, I believe, of all athletes will ever play college sports? And so, I mean, if you're really? D three, D one, I mean, it is extremely low. So if you were one of that rare uh, few that played either of them, congratulations! It puts you in, it puts you in a, a very small minority. Yeah. No, but baseball was. It, it's funny because I play. It, you can't do that now because everyone specializes. Like mm-hmm. back then, you just played a bunch of sports. Like you just like in in high school, you were required to play a sport each season. In my high school, that was a requirement. You didn't have to be good at it, but you had to play. So Kirk, you Kirk. tended to get these natural athletes who were there, who were just like playing the sports, and other kids played like you know aerobics or weightlifting. But um, but it was acceptable. Now you can't because there's, it requires too much specialization, which isn't good for the kids, but that's the way this the culture is lined up. Well, you're being told that by a lot of these clubs now. And again, once you get to college, you kind of have to, I mean, it used to be those days. Like I remember Ricky Dudley played football for Ohio state. He also played basketball for Ohio state. You don't see those guys that are running track and playing basketball anymore, but um, most, they actually interviewed a lot of the top professional players in hockey and basketball, football, most of those guys still came back and said, I played multiple sports. So and at, I mean, there is still extreme value. By the way, I posted a picture since we're talking about it. You can throw it up there, the famous basket catch for every for, for someone who's been under a rock for their entire for multiple generations. And while you're pulling that up, there's another big loss this week. Donald Sutherland passed away. So yeah, I, I know icon of night. Hollywood. So yeah, yeah, Donald Sutherland, I always liked him. He never I don't remember him having any like starring roles, but he was always like a great actor in, in a lot of different films. So supporting actor, I suppose. But I, somebody told me he never got an Oscar. Like he was he was the greatest ath- actor that never got an Oscar. Is what I, I, heard. I believe it. And, you know, the be- you know what his greatest win was, Kirk? He was married for over 50 years. And, you know, in Hollywood, that is something that never happens. Now, granted, it was his third wife. But eventually got it right. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, uh, that's, uh, that's a good one. I like that. Yeah, he he was great in Hunger Games. If you never had a chance to see it, he was he was absolutely just oh his role as kind of the the leading like uh, uh, purveyor of the of the games. I mean, he just was so versatile. And it looks like in 2017. They did give him an honorary Academy Award for his body of work, but it does not look like he ever, you're right, he never won an Academy Award for anything else. He was never, it's not that he didn't win, he was never even nominated for an Academy Award. So he did get a wet, he did get an Emmy in 1995 for TV film Citizen X and two Golden Globes, but he never actually That's... got a nomination, which is incredible because, I mean, I think of all the roles he got, he was in, and you're right, as a, more of a supporting actor, Never nominated once, which I and, and if I were to list 10 of the iconic actors that have come to mind, like a De Niro or a Pacino, 
Donald Sutherland is easily in my top 10. He is, he always had a massive presence on, on the, on the screen. So he'll probably get a posthumous, uh, a lifetime achievement award or something like that. People tend to do that and they're like, Oh crap, we forgot about him. Kind of a, kind of a situation, but exactly. Uh, but moving on, that's, uh, it is what it is. So yeah, baseball, hockey was my number one love baseball. I just happen to be really good at. So, uh, Very nice. it's hard to, hard to stop playing both when you, you know, when you're good at something, you're like, oh, I'm going to keep, keep going here. And mm -hmm. I decided, you know what? Uh, and you know, it's funny. I'll, I'll relay this story because I don't like talking about myself, but, um, I relay the story. So hockey, I was never under any illusion. I was going to the NHL. Like I loved it. I would have loved that, but it's just, you know, it was a different, it's probably the hardest sport of all of them to go professional. I, I know people that track these junior hockey players that, I mean, they know who's going to make the NHL at like eight. It's, in, yeah. it's insane. Right now it's, it's different than grown up. Like grown up, it was like, are you tough enough to play the sport? And mm -hmm. are you talented enough? But it was, it was a different sport. Like the sticks were heavy. The skates were heavy. Like now, like all the stuff they have is light. all the kids are agile. Mm -hmm. it's it's weird like no one checks anymore like it's it, there's contact but like growing up it was like how can you have an open ice hit and just like just knock the guy out or like open ice hip check you can't hit, do a hip check anymore it's the game's too fast to even throw a hip check so yeah. you see stuff like that it's like it's just a different game it's you know baseball is a different game right they had to speed it up because it's boring you know people weren't watching so let's speed it up and so you get all these things that they're trying to keep sports relevant and you know, it's funny because w when you have uh, people like Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, you got people like that who are just uh, amazing athletes. And then afterwards, they're like, you know, uh, they were probably the best athlete because they played in the Negro Leagues, uh, which, you know, was before Jackie Robinson broke into the, the white leagues. And there were some great athletes there that weren't recognized. And they're like, well, all of these athletes had better records. They should be recognized. I'm like, you know what? That's like introducing steroids and saying steroids. Oh, you did steroids, but you're, you still broke records in those count how do you, it, it just has to be an agreement. Like, I don't know what the right answer is. I'm not going to say it, but I will say there were some amazing um, athletes back then that weren't recognized in the Negro leagues. And, um, and it was, but that was a different, different uh, sport back then. I Wait. think somebody said it was, um, I forget who they were claiming, like Willie Mays was better than like, he was the third, third highest home runs uh, behind Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so when you start kind of going back to the old records, you look at this and you're like, all right, what's the what's what's really important here? I mean, you know, Ted Williams arguably was one of the best best baseball players of all time. However, in his prime, he lost I don't know how many years, like seven years of his prime because of the war. He went yep. off to war. He missed his prime years. He could have been exponentially better in terms of stats, but because he went off to war, he didn't. So it's like. You know, like, where do you draw the line for these? We're like, well, Ted Williams is better, but he didn't do it. And it's like, these people were in the eager leagues, but they weren't with everyone else. Like, you know, it's just keeping people happy, all it is. As long as you recognize the people for who they were, that's all that really matters. Like, they're great athletes. Great, great. Much respect for all of them because they're doing things none of us can. Totally. And, and, to, find, and to kind of round that out, um, two things. A, um, I argue Tony, Tony Gwynn right up there uh, as one of the greatest hitters of all time, hands down. The stuff that you know, more modern day pitchers would say that he could do and could, and, and could never strike him out. It's insane. Um, gr unbelievable to watch him and re you know, rest in peace for, you know, for his, uh, his early loss, but is he, dead? Uh, Tony Gwynn, is he, dead now? he did. Yeah. Tony, oh, okay. Tony Gwynn died. I forget when he, when he passed away. Uh, I think it was maybe during, maybe during COVID. Um, but they, but what I was also, yeah, he passed away in, uh, no, actually way before that. He died at 54 years old in 2014. So yeah, really, really, unfortunately, uh, premature death. But what I was going to round it out by saying is that you're talking about the Negro League uh, statistics. They actually got incorporated in Major League Baseball uh, this year in May. And Josh Gibson now, because of that, is statistically... And has is now being recognized as the greatest player of all time. Josh Gibson is the, I mean, a lot of people give Jackie Robinson obviously you know, the the credit for being the first to be admitted into the majors and breaking that barrier. Willie Mays basically said, I think he quoted was quoted recently, you know, at some point in the more recent years of saying, I owe everything to Jackie, right? But if anybody were to look at who was truly the dominant player and maybe the one that should have come over at the time, Josh Gibson. Josh Gibson absolutely dominated those leagues. 
Yeah, I didn't follow Josh Gibson, but I have to give credit. Actually, if you want to give credit where credit's due, nobody talks about him. But Branch Rickey was really yes. the guy you can attribute. He's the one that signed Jackie mm -hmm. Robinson, and he was he was an innovator himself. So actually, I mean, not to take away from Jackie because he he obviously did the hard work, but he had to be he you know. But the whole thing had to be done eloquently because they picked a guy who was a hothead. All of a sudden, you 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 know, you regress. But Jackie Robinson had put up a lot, and he uh, he certainly was the guy to bring on, but Branch Rickey sh should get more credit than he gets because he was the guy who was instrumental in making that happen. So Jackie was the politician. He was the perfect selection yeah, for that he was. first immigration. Yep. He was. Yeah. Anyway, getting back to the Marcus, because some people are probably confused. I think they sent it for a sports show. And we never talk about sports. Um, it's all about statistics. You know, market the, statistics. Come on. It's integrated somehow. We can loosely tie these. All right, here's, here's my segue. So all these statistics, you said the greatest player of all time. How do you mark the greatest player? Like, is it home runs? Is it batting average? Is it slugging average? Like, there's no unified statistic. It's like, oh, it's this one. No, it could be any of them, right? It's So anyway, neither, neither here nor there. And that actually does segue into market statistics, because if you think about it, what's the best market statistic to look for of, of uh, a good performer? Is it PE? Is it PEG? You know, is it uh, sales rate? Is it uh, price to sales? Like, there's so many different metrics. And you know what? There is no single metric that defines the best stock. The best stock is what's performing the best, what's the best growth rate. I mean, you could probably argue that this year NVIDIA is the best stock because it's done the best. I don't know if it's still the best stock, and I'm certainly not making a recommendation, but um, it's easy to define in hindsight because you could just look at things and put, it's like an economist, right? An economist is great at looking at the past and saying, here's what happened. Oh, thanks, guy. Like you're getting a call, you're getting an academic, academic degree to, uh, to tell us what happened. I could do that. I don't have, you know, anyway. Um, Point being is, is you never look at a single thing. You always have to look at things as an aggregate, whether it's baseball players, hockey players, uh, financial stats. You have to look at an aggregate because if there was a single thing, it wouldn't be a single thing. Think about this for a moment. Here's a little uh, psycho psychological experiment. If there was a single best way to do things, everyone would know about it. And if everybody knew about it, it would no longer work. I'm just, I'm not going to explain that. Think about it for a moment. Efficient if market theory. This, if everyone did the same thing, it wouldn't work, right? Because if you found something that makes sense, as Doug said, efficient market theory, the market uh, arbitrages out all of these inefficiencies. Now, I'm not saying the market's efficient because it's not, but the nature of the market arbitrages out inefficiencies. So if I find that if I buy um, gold in the US and I sell it in China and I can make 5% on that trade, I will do that all day. And as soon as other people see me doing it, they're going to start doing it and other people and other people. And then millions of people are going to start doing it. And you know what? Then that arbitrage is going to disappear. It'll turn into zero. And then that's no longer there. That's how the markets work. That's how that's how these inefficiencies to disappear because the arbitrage mechanism of people trying to make a profit and seeing it, and they all kind of pile into the same trade, it causes it to disappear because there's no more uh, people on the other side of the trade, everyone's on one side. So, so now that now the pricing mechanism, it works efficiently, but it doesn't work for the people who are trying to make the buck. So they stop doing it, right? So that's how markets work. So you should always be aware if you think there's a tried and true system that someone's trying to sell you that's foolproof, it's not foolproof. It may be foolproof for a short period of time and it'll disappear because other people will see the opportunity. There are hedge funds with hundreds of millions of dollars in research budgets looking for this. You're, if you're lucky enough to find things, it might be because they're too small for a hedge fund. I'll give you one example and I'll, I'll let Doug talk a little bit before we get into some other big news, which is really important. Um, I found an arbitrage opportunity with an insurance company. They were taking the company private and they what they said was, we're going to buy all the shares from shareholders at a certain price. And if you, I'm trying to remember the specifics, it was like five years ago. It was basically if you had 249 shares, they would cash you out. If you had 250 shares or more, they would exchange it for new shares in the private company, which of course you couldn't sell because it's private. Um, so if you still wanted to own it, then you would, you would get to keep the new company. If not, they would cash you out for cash, 250, 49 shares or less. Now the arbitrage opportunity was like 15%. So you could make 15%. It wasn't guaranteed because the because uh, it had to be voted on. 
by the owners, by the you know shareholders. However, the majority shareholders were two people that were pushing this deal. So it wasn't quote unquote guaranteed, but it was as close to guarantees you can get without a vote. And so basically you made 15%. The problem was it was limited to like, I, know, I think it was like 10 to $20,000. So you made a thousand bucks or 1200 bucks was the max you could make. So we we're kind of looking at this arbitrage and we're like, why is this here? It's like, well, it's because hedge funds don't care. Like making a thousand bucks, whatever. That's like pocket change for those guys. So you can always find these things. They're hard to find, but um, usually at scale you won't because the big institutions will arbitrage it out and that just won't exist anymore. Is inflation getting you down? Do you feel like your money is worth less every time you open your wallet? Is shrinkflation frustrating you at the grocery store? Well, I have an answer for you. We're giving away free money. That's right. I said it. Free money. I feel like I'm not doing my part to create inflation. Why does the government get to have all the fun? What could be better at increasing inflation than giving away free money? No, I'm not an employee of the Federal Reserve. And no, I'm not an employee of the U.S. government either. And no, I am definitely not printing it myself. But it's free. What more could you ask? Well, you might ask, is it real? Well, yes, it's totally real. I'm holding it in my hands right here, see? Oh, wait, this is a podcast. You can't see it. Either way, I'm holding it in my hands right now, and I want to give it to you. If you want some free money, go to moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. Follow the instructions and I'll send some to you. Enjoy your free money today. I'm not the Federal Reserve, so I only have a limited supply. This offer is good until I run out. Go to www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. What are some of your thoughts, Doug? And I want to get to the big news of the week. Well, I, I think uh, a great, another good example of uh, when, when somebody thinks they cracked the code is momentum, right? For a long time, for a while there, all of a sudden there were people that, that, you know, smart minds that came up and said, look, momentum is a great way to track when the, and the, the philosophy being that once we see that the money starts to pick up, into inflows or we start to see a price movement on a stock that there you know you see it early you're going to be able to catch the momentum and historically that momentum would take a while to shift and therefore you would you know would be the first one in but you could catch the wave and ride it into shore um everybody started doing it momentum became a an underlying uh focus of many many different uh technical methodologies and to the point in which what would start to happen, and now you add in computerized trading as well as another catalyst, which can move faster than any human, all of a sudden, you know, you're jumping into something. By the time you saw the momentum, instead of being on the early wave action wave, you ended up being near the end of the action wave. And by the time that the momentum was now noticeable because it was already being seen, you were already on the back end of that reader of, of a re, uh, reversal. Is momentum gone dead? No. Um, I think there's still a lot to be accounted for with momentum, but you can't use it in an isolated situation anymore. Like at one point you could, um, what's funny, uh, you know, and, and again, if you even look at, um, you know, kind of, you know, other areas of kind of trying to find things, I'll tell you something, Kirk, that I think is hysterical because we've talked about this, but there are some things out there on the, uh, uh, on, on that you can find that are, are basically doing congressional tracking. Um, and so now the new arbitrage that everybody's felt or, or the new the, the new indicator that everybody's trying to jump into is what are your what is your local co congressional doing? And I'm not going to name them here, but uh, someone that we know in the investment world has just released two ETFs that are tracking the way that the way the pre the Democrats are doing their investing and the Republicans are doing their investing just so that you can ride the wave of those wonderful, arguably insider moves again. Once everybody jumps on it, will it be as effective? Twelve to four, twenty-four months from now, I'm not sure those ETFs will be uh, uh, will, will be as successful as they may sound in the beginning. But hey, you know what? For the time being, there's there's there has definitely been a new code that people feel that they have cracked because they've certainly seen some successes from from certain congressional whales out there in their recent in investing decisions. 
uh, and you know, based on information that they may have that you know before you. But again, that go. But that's the last thing I want to get. If, if, going back to the efficient markets, is like is do does everybody know? Another great example would be uh, GameStop, and uh, you know, we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, Krusty Kitty. I always forget his name. What is it, Kirk? Uh, Roaring Kitty. Bo bo boring. Yeah, Roaring, Roaring Kitty. Roaring. Roaring Kitty. Roaring Kitty discovered something a couple years ago, uh, you know, that he basically saw that hedge funds were publishing their shorts. Well, if you publish your shorts and let everybody know how much money you're betting against the market, you know, historically that had not had much impact at all. Who cares? But in the day's day and age of information, he found that there, he found that there was some really heavy bets against AMC and GameStop and a handful of others. And he was able to get enough rallying momentum to say, look, if we can then turn and, and I can get enough people to invest into this as long positions, we could put pressure on these hedge funds. And eventually the hedge funds will take such a loss that they will re remove those, those shorts. And that will create what we call a short squeeze and the market goes in the moon. And it did for a period of time. Again, now that one thing that he's discovered is that he's trying to repeat it again. Had some a little bit of movement there in GameStop again because there was some more short bets on it, but it didn't have the same effect it had a couple years ago. And I bet you to guess that if this becomes the new thing that everybody's going to try to move on, it will it will not be uh, near the level of success that it was when it was first discovered. This, that's just what happens once everybody knows about it. It's not. It's it. It may still be successful, but you're certainly not going to be able to bet that it's going to be some transcendent success that's going to outpace the re normal returns on the market with, uh, you know, with confidence. So. Yeah, I think I think in that position, he had 150,000 options at 20, which now there's only 56. Uh, so it, it, it's trading at a little under 25. So I believe he's in the money if he still owns those those options. But uh, but kudos for him for for managing the system. I mean, hedge funds have been doing it for years and you got an individual, mm -hmm. which the congressman, because they don't have anything else to do. I've decided to come after him or Massachusetts is deciding whether they're going to come after him. So let me get this straight. So uh, basically congressmen and women who are, who are allowed to do insider trading are coming after an individual citizen uh, for basically managing the markets when institutions do it all the time. Using public information. Use, using, yeah, you, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he's using public information. He used public information. They're coming after him for using public information. Right, right. And, <laughs> and, and he's doing things that all the hedge funds do as well. And I don't know if it's right or wrong. That's not the point. The point is, is everyone's doing it and they're not going after the big institutions. They're only going after the little man, which speaks volumes to our politicians these days. Yeah, let's go after the people we can because they're weak and, they're, and they don't have a huge budget. Although I think he's made a lot of money now because of, the, because of his position. But anyway. Getting back to the most important news of the week. Actually, we have two no, two more uh, important news of the week. Drum roll, please. Here it is. The Senate passed a nuclear bill. Now it's in Biden's desk, which most likely he will approve. And uh, I, I would like to I would like to thank everybody for all your support. And uh, you're welcome uh, for for us talking about this for like the last two years. Um, anyway, the point being is. Uh, they finally got their head out of their collective butt, bipartisan. It's probably the only thing they've done bipartisan in the last eight years. Um, and bipartisan support, I think there are only two people who, who uh, said no. And um, basically, the bill, so to speak, addresses the issue. I don't know how effective it will be, but the idea is to drop the cost and to speed up the permitting process. So the speeding up of the permitting process will cut the fees. They're also trying to make sure that it costs less and happens faster. So if you look at uh, Bill Gates' company, uh, Terra Power, uh, they're trying to do, I think, some modular reactors. And I think the earliest they'll be able to produce one is 23rd. And they're just waiting. They're waiting to be approved. And they're like, they, they're already set, and they're just waiting for them to say, OK. Um, Craig, can we, can, I'm sorry, Kirk, can we, can we just declare Bill Gates a public stock and invest in him now? Because I feel like... <laughs> But he's, the, he's the ultimate insider, him and Warren Buffett. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but but seriously, like the the technology of, of of nuclear power is far surpassing what happened with the with the Three Mile Island scare and and even Fukushima. Like all this new stuff is is crazy. If anyone 
is afraid of nuclear, I dare you to look into the new technology. It is going to blow your mind. Um, the stuff they're coming out with, the stuff that they're that they're the technology they're creating. They're they they have reactors that don't melt down. They have reactors that will eat the nuclear waste as fuel. So you basically are going to have almost no nuclear waste anymore. They have modular reactors that you can put in in like a room, like in your house, like they're tiny, and yet they'll power a whole town. Like. The technology is crazy. It's out there. It's, Kurt, it, it really comes down to permitting. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, they actually have ways now to go back, and they're looking at, of course, the efficiency of this, to go back to the old nuclear waste sites where they have dumped the nuclear waste and reuse the old material now right. in efficient ways that will allow us to basically clean up the environmental disasters that we've already gotten from storage from that. It's inc- it's it's Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually in line with what happened with oil. And in, in Texas, they had all these oil fields that were pumped like decades ago. And they're like, oh, these things are useless. And what people don't realize is when they pump oil, they only get like 30 percent of it. Like they're, they're not getting all of it. They're getting like 30 percent. And they're like, well, we can't get the rest. It's, it's not cost effective to get it. Well, what happened in um, when did this start? After 2008, it was like 2012 or something like that. They came out with fracking and, mm-hmm. and fracking changed. It was a game changer. Now they can get like another 30 percent. And so they got a lot more oil. They just retapped the old fields and they went in and got more of, uh, of the oil and they got gas, too. So what I think the um, the people who, who think the world is ending and we're going to run out of stuff, what they don't realize is it's not a question of running out of stuff. It's a question of cost. So if the cost is too high, people will come up with a technology to reduce the cost because that's what happened with oil. It was too, it was getting too high. And they're like, all right, somebody came up with fracking. Cool. Now we can reduce the cost again. Now we have a, abundant energy in the U.S. that we're not even tapping. We're literally airing natural gas into, into, into the air because we can't use it. There's an overabundance and it's just they're gassing it. They're basically like lighting it on fire to get so it doesn't you know create problems. But the point is, is like we have so much we don't have to do it because of fracking. And all fracking was, was an attempt at lowering the cost of getting oil out of the ground. That's innovation. Nuclear is going through an innovation renaissance right now, where people are coming out with all these cool ideas and ways to generate nuclear energy, which is clean. It's cheap. It solves everybody's problems on the left, on the right. No one should object to this except for the scaredy cats that are afraid that there's going to be a meltdown in their neighborhood. And I'm not minimizing that because certainly there are issues, but um, the point being is, is what's more important to you? Is it more important to save the planet or is it more important to have cheap energy or is yes. it more important to, to NIMBY, not in my backyard? I mean, you know, if you're complaining about what, if, if you're saying, well, I want a cleaner planet, but I don't want to do it in my backyard. Well, you're part of the problem. I live in a state of NIMBYs, right? Um, I, I don't want wind power that's disrupting my view of the ocean, even though there's a lot of wind there. Like, you know, you, you got to pick your poison, right? You can't be, you can't be, uh, talking out of both sides of your mouth. So if you think about where we're headed on this, it's going to be a renaissance of energy. And we talk about this in the show. What is the one factor that contributes to booms in society? Cheap, abundant energy. The more cheap, abundant energy you have, the more energy that's used, which is contributing to more growth, more production, more advancements, I mean, think about the data centers. I We talked about this in the show two weeks ago. All of a sudden, all the green energy, save the planet kind of garbage PR that's coming out of the corporate media, it all just kind of vanished. And we talked about this because it's something I watch. Where's all the talk of you got to save the planet, you got all this like green movement garbage? Where did that all go? Are people no longer interested in that? Of course they are. But no, what happened was is that stopped. Now this is going to come out, oh, we're going to focus on nuclear energy. It's great. It's going to green the planet and all this. So you get, people say, well, fake news and all that stuff, and they get fired up, and they're like, well, it's politics. No, this is a, this is, what I notice is not necessarily the information. It's the, it's the scam. Like there's an element of when somebody's trying to manipulate you, it follows a certain framework. And if you understand the framework, you can notice it. And when you notice it, now you know when you're being manipulated. Now, I'm not saying the manipulation is necessarily wrong. That's a different question. But I'm saying you're being manipulated. So you have to ask the question, why am I being manipulated? And do I want to be manipulated? 
And you could say, yeah, I believe in green energy and I want to be an amoeba. Okay. But I'm not judging. I'm just saying noticing this framework helps you understand how things work. Wall Street does the same thing. I'm tying this back to Wall Street. Wall Street does the same thing. If you notice, they have frameworks. There was a, a there was a DEI framework on corporate uh, corporations, which is now kind of reversing because people are like, this 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 is dumb. You know, idea is fine, but like the implementation doesn't work. Um, you know, then you had the uh, ESG. Oh, ESG is a good idea. All that was was we call it greenwashing on Wall Street, right? It's just greenwashing. It's not it's not a real thing. It didn't really matter. If you really looked at behind the curtains, if you looked at the bowels of the beast of how those things work, you realize like, why is 5% of an ESG fund in Exxon Mobil when I'm trying to get rid of companies like that? So the whole thing was bunk and people on the street knew that, but the retail investors didn't. So they had this thing and once they realized, all right, people are done with that, we're gonna stop promoting that. Now we're gonna promote this new thing. And so Wall Street has done this over and over and over again. And if you know how it works, you can you can identify it. You can say, oh, they're they're promoting this thing now. They're promoting this thing now. And you can't. So we talk about it in the show. Why do we talk about it in the show? It's not because I hate Wall Street or I hate politics, even though I do hate politics. But it, it's not because of that. It's because if you know what they're doing, you can identify it. You can stop it. You can say, all right, here's what's going on. OK, I'm aware. So what we're doing is we're working on your mindset. We're making you aware of what's going on so you can be a smarter investor. Because if you start to understand how these frames affect you, you can actually step back and say, all right, here's how it's making me feel. It's making me feel like I want to go gamble in a, in a high flying stock right now because everyone else is doing it. Or it might make you feel like I got to get out because, oh, my God, the world's ending. It, it, it's, it's understanding how your emotions are affecting you. So all this is to say, understand what's going on. Understand that this frame is happening. And um, I got one more big news. I'm going to let Doug talk about it a little bit. Any, any any thoughts on the on the nuclear? Oh no 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 sorry go no I, I, I thought you're moving, I thought you're moving to the next thing. thing I think you've covered no. it great no, go ahead okay. all right next thing is related uh, this was not widely reported and I actually wasn't even aware of this until it was until I it popped up on my newsfeed um, most people don't know that 50 years ago we apparently some Wall Street firm but we created a trade with Saudi Arabia and that trade people I think superficially knew about it but they didn't realize it was like a contract it was like a 50-year contract and the trade was back then in the 70s we had a volatile oil environment okay oil prices spiked you had gas line you had like lines at the gas station you could only get gas once a week out of an odd or even number and all that crap that stuff was crazy and I wasn't around for that I was you know, too young to remember. But that stuff was crazy, right? And so what happened was the, is that we made a deal with them which created stability both in the Middle East and here in oil prices, right? Because we talked about cheap, abundant energy is what creates growth. What happened in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s? Hell of a lot of growth. We're still getting that growth, right? So what happened was is there was an agreement where oil from Saudi Arabia, which is one of the biggest producers, would be traded in dollars. Everybody would be trading using dollars to trade in oil. In exchange for that, we would provide their security for 50 years. So we'd provide security for that country, right? Because they had some problems, right, in the Middle East back then. They weren't the country they are today where they're building monoliths in a desert. They they were a bunch of camel riders. Like they just, they, they just it was the ruling family and they happened to to have control and they they decided, all right, this is a good deal for them. I think it was a great deal for them. And they've built massive wealth. They're some of the wealthiest people on the planet now. Now they've got other problems. How do you transfer that wealth into sustainable wealth? But but they did a great job. I mean, really admirable job of what they did. And then the US, we also benefited because everyone used the dollar and it became the world reserve currency de facto because of oil. But now that that's gone, well, now we got some problems. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but we've started to lose our dollar superiority over the last 10 years, let's say. So when glo when deglobalization started to happen, it was before Trump. Trump really accelerated it, put an adrenaline shot of deglobalization, which caused more inflation. So stuff's starting to cost more here. So he started it. 
Biden continued it with the war in Ukraine that we decided to, hey, we're going to go after Russia. Like, that was dumb. Like, I, I mean, I, I get it, but it's just a dumb move. Um, and so now we've tried to uh, go after Russia. And yet, what have they done? Quality society hasn't changed for Russia. All that people have done is said, you know what? The U.S. is trying to grab, grab people's money. They're trying to grab this. So we're going to create our own systems. So now the Asian markets are creating their own systems. They're getting away from the SWIFT system. Uh, our Saudi Arabia deal has expired. Obviously, that's not being renewed because they don't need us anymore. They've got their own protection. And I'm sure they're still buying military stuff from us, which is a different question. But point being is that that's, that's gone, but they don't need us anymore. They've got other protection. There's other global powers. So slowly but surely, we're losing our global power. Our reserve currency status is not going to, it's not going to happen overnight. And there's, there's one major reason why the U.S. has the deepest, most liquid markets and, um, of any currency in the planet. And you say, well, China should take them over. China won't do it. They're untrustworthy. They're becoming a world power and they're, and they're in some ways they are, but, um, but they're, but no one's going to trust them for their currency. They've got too much weird stuff there that is untrustworthy. Who else could use? Maybe the euro, but the EU's got their own issues. It's not big enough. It's not deep enough. Um, so the U.S. still will retain its power for a little while, but it's slowly going to be uh, dem- uh, minimizing. And I think what will probably happen is we'll have a global global reserve currency where it's a basket. It's the only way you could do it. Some people talk about, well, it'll be an oil basket. Really? We're going to give up our we're going to give up an oil basket to Saudi Arabia so they'll be controlling the world. No, that's not going to work. No one's going to agree to that. So realistically, it's going to come down to you could say commodities. It's a good idea, but it's impractical. Um, realistically, it has to be some sort of global exchange, you know, currency that, that special drawing rights or something like that. That's that's going to be the, the, the most logical outcome, whether you like it or not. I'm not saying it's a good idea because I don't agree with it, but it's the most logical outcome of it. So just think about how that's going to play into the dollar. And what that basically means is stuff's going to keep getting more expensive here. So if you think inflation's going away, it's not. It's going to stay. It might get worse depending on what happens. But you got to be aware of it because if you're not aware of it, it's going to get you into trouble. What are your thoughts, Doug? Well, uh, the, the the destabilization happens and it, it goes well. It goes even well beyond the financial impact of it. Is the fact that there is this um, this kind of separation of uh, loyalty to the United States, and you talked about going basically at war against the you know get against Russia you know via Ukraine. Um, what you're starting to see is, at least right now, an ex- an expanding amount of vibrato coming from uh, many of our his- many of the United States historic, uh, you know, enemies. Right. So just just this past uh, just a couple of days ago, I mean, Putin was down in uh, North Korea and uh, created a, a new pact between them that may potentially uh, increase North Korean ambition, you know, support for their nuclear ambitions. Um, it may also, uh, you know, based off of what they talked about, that you know, Russia did not rule out developing military and technical cooperation with North Korea, Korea under the deal. Um, we have obviously spent a lot of uh, time and effort over many decades trying to put sanctions and have the world kind of, uh, you know, undermine the North Korean regime for, you know, you know, in, in order to support you know, for the support of South Korea. And this clearly makes South Korea very nervous, uh, given the fact that South Korea, you know, you know, shares that border has been technically at war with them ever since the Korean War, and obviously does a lot of economic trade with us, including, you know, Japan, a lot of economic trade with us. And even to the extent of, you know, you know, concerns over North Korea being, uh, are, are they a stable, you know, again, they've got, they've got the nuclear, ca- or they're trying to really get nuclear capabilities, but you know, there, there is obviously a lot of rhetoric from them that, you know, often, you know, for whether it's political or is real seems a little bit crazy. We'll just put it that way. And even to the point that the more powerful North Korea gets, it actually makes China nervous. But right now, all of those very, you know, you know, all of those extreme differences uh, that many of that, that all of those different entities have 
uh, you know, it, it, and again, you know, held together by, you know, a loose definition of communism anymore, because technically Russia isn't, although if you look at where it's kind of going back to, it, it, it's definitely seems to be, um, you know, you know, at least admiring its its roots, you know, given who leads them. And then, of course, the alliances between Russia and, uh, you know, and China and Russia and North Korea. And and he's going, you know, and Russia's going to be trying to increase, um, you know, relations. I think he's going to uh, Vietnam next, which, of course, Vietnam has had warmer relations with us over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, as China's gotten more expensive in, uh, in their ability to, uh, you know, produce goods at the level they did. Vietnam has started to be a place we've turned to, to do a lot more of our uh, manufacturing and support. So, you know, all we're, we're all of, here's the thing, Kirk, were all of those um, relationships there before? Absolutely. But what's new now, at least over, like you said, the last 10 years, but really expedited, expedited I would say since the beginning of the Ukraine conflict, is the willingness for all of those entities to be to, to feel that they're in a position to just outwardly tell the United States, we don't need you anymore, we don't care. And that has culminated in Saudi Arabia, a very strategic ally of ours that, as you said, used us for defense because the Saud family uh, really is a, was a small collection uh, you know, that really had a lot of enemies within Saudi within, within Arabia. Right? They were holding on to power loosely, and we were a great support to them in order to help them maintain and continue to hold the power that they had. It allowed us to put bases over there and build a, you know, and really there was a lot of both, you know, economic and geopolitical reason to be there. Well, Saudi Aramco is now top five wealthy, you know, highest market cap in the world, and the Saudi family owns all of that. Right, so. Combined estimate of the Saudi uh, of the Saudi family, there's about 15,000 members, about 2,000 hold all the wealth, and the combined wealth of that family is about an estimated 1.7 trillion dollars. That's just how much they know they have based on calculations of Saudi Ramco. So they can now financially support to themselves well beyond the GDP, you know, well beyond the needs of the U.S. GDP to support them. And so now they are turning to basically exert their own power as they've become more dominant on the world stage, as oil has continued to be the, the big, you know, the big, uh, you know, most important thing that this world has, as you said, energy is everything. And it is still driven by oil energy. Now, let's, let's pull this thing full circle. You talked about nuclear. What is one of the things that can come out beneficial from, you know, what Congress is looking at and loosening the, the nuclear rules is let's forget the green energy aspect for a second. Let's forget the clean energy aspect. Let's forget all the feel good stuff. The ability to use nuclear is 100% a significant shot at the, at the, what's going, what's going on with the oil relations, the, the, the 50 year agreement, all of this other stuff, because almost all of those countries are exceptionally reliant still on oil. Okay. That's, ex you know, Russia's economy, they're still a massive oil producer. They're part, Russia's part of OPEC. You've got Venezuela, part of OPEC, OPEC. you got Saudi Arabia. And they, again, if they don't have aligned interests with the United States, let's go back to the 1970s. We did not have aligned interests for a while in the 1970s, and look what happened with the embargoes, right? And ultimately, if we can get into nuclear and other energies and reduce the reliance, and, and of course, in, in combination, that goes back to what was happening 10 years ago with the production of the Balkan fields. As the United States is able to produce more oil itself and rely less on the impact and the, and the pricing control of Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC nations, ultimately, it will allow the United States to be somewhat immune to the to the impact of what is now being you know what is now being the the uh, the the taking away of the United States as the world currency. Okay, but we the United States will have to expedite that faster. And going back full circle, nuclear. If we can get that technology where it looks like it's now heading in terms of safety and obviously incredible efficiency. It, it has an in, in incredible 
potential impact on, on the value of oil. And you could see a significant reduction in the world influence if oil becomes less and less in demand. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something that, you know, like Doug and I are saying, this is not something that you should um, underestimate at all. This is going to be one of those things where people pull, uh, look back and they're like, that was the moment. Now, there is no one moment because there's multiple things. We've talked about it and they've actually all been lining up uh, one after the other, because it's really a 50 year deal. And, and so I, I'm not naive enough to think that people didn't think this through well ahead of time. And they're like, all right, well, this is happening. This is happening. And so we're going to treat them differently. And as, as you've noticed in the last uh, few years that we've treated the Saudis differently. Um, Absolutely. so my, my belief would be that our, our government knew in advance that it would not be renewing the deal. I mean, they don't need to. So it, it, you know, like we've got our own oil, They've got theirs. We're kind of independent. We don't really need it. So I think what happened was there was this, um, let's just say this friction between the two. Um, and by the way, they have a lot of money flooding into our country, trying to influence us. There, there have been some news stories about a lot of colleges getting uh, Kuwaiti money. And, and there's just, there's a ton of that. Like people talk about September 11th, we didn't go after Saudi Arabia, even all the hijackers from there. Like there's all that stuff, that politics that happens. Um, I don't want to get into all of it because it's it's just too much, and we're not about that show. But what you should be aware is is that OPEC has a lot of power right now because a we've given them a lot of that because we just kicked sand in the face of Russia, who's a member of OPEC, and Saudi Arabia. We're not in the best terms right now, so as you know, bad as it's been declining for 15 right. years. Yeah, so we don't we're not in the best terms with most of the oil producers. I mean, we are. With Canada, we are with Nigeria. They're another oil producer, but 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 some of the bigger ones we're not, and we are also a big producer, which is good. But if we don't transition to nuclear quickly, we could have another '70s moment where we're SOL at some point in time because we're not, produ you know, for whatever reason we're not producing or whatever. But we have to be aware that that these are these are challenges. These transitional challenges are very significant. They have been in historically, and if they're not managed well, they could turn into a, you know, a firefight. I mean, if you think historically, the times of transition are when wars happen. It's a transitioning of power. Nobody in our country wants to believe it. We've had this, this privilege for so long because we're the world reserve currency. Other, other countries don't have the ability to just print money at will. Imagine if we couldn't take on more debt. Imagine if we had to actually balance our budget and or pay it down. Imagine if that was the case. We'd have a very different country. And, and all the politicians that are looting us right now and just spending money like drunken sailors, they wouldn't have to do that. We'd have to have a, a, a melee um, moment where Chainsaw Al, <laughs> Chainsaw Melee comes in and, and, and slices up the government. Like that's going to have to happen at some point because it is what we're doing is unsustainable. I'm not going to sit in here in my soapbox to complain about everybody, but but the reality is is our uh, I wanted to I wanted to uh, share I'm going to find this chart that, that Doug had sent here it is government interest expense so uh, government interest expense crosses one trillion dollars uh, you know the trend is obviously up it's been up for a while but look at that rocket ship that is a straight shot up and it only gets steeper as interest rates remain high and we continue to keep printing money. So if you're not a math major, you don't have to be. All you have to do is have, you know, third grade math to realize that as interest rates are high and you have uh, debt keeps increasing at some point, you can't pay that. And I don't know what that point is, because at this point, we're just we're not a banana republic yet, but we're pretty close. Right. When when the competing presidential contender gets arrested and convicted, that's banana republic territory. Right. Um, you know, saying that he can't be on the ballot is Banana Republic territory. Right. Like that's that's the kind of shenanigans that happen in the Banana Republics. And we always used to make fun of them because they're like, oh, it was just a bunch of tin pot dictators. We're doing it here and wait until this number gets beyond obnoxious. I mean, we have what, 35 trillion in government debt, not including uh, government uh, entitlements. We're probably close to 100 trillion in what we owe. There's no way we can pay that. There's abs the math doesn't work. We can't pay it. So what's going to happen? A lot of pain. 
It's not necessarily going to happen all at once, but uh, the thought I want to leave everybody with, and I want to give it to Doug as well, um, is you should be preparing for harder times ahead. Just because they're not today, it doesn't mean they won't be in the future. And I'm not even saying we're going to have a recession tomorrow. I'm saying times are going to get tougher ahead. Everyone's going to start pinching pennies. They're going to tighten their belt. There are plenty of people who are making plenty of money, and there's a lot of people who aren't making enough. Things are going to get harder. And so the best thing you can do is to start trying to prepare yourself by saving, having emergency fund, preparing ahead of time. And I'm not talking about COVID prepare, like, you know, stock up on toilet paper. I mean, just prepare financially. You know, make sure you're not overextending. Make sure you don't have a lot of debt. Make sure you're paying down your debt. Now, I don't mean a mortgage. If you have a 3% mortgage, that's insanity to pay that down. You should not pay that down. You should keep it. It's 3%. If, if you could trade mortgages, I would easily buy that. That's great. I would take it and pop it on a new house. That would be, that'd be really valuable. But for, unfortunately, banks don't allow that anymore. So point being is prepare ahead. Don't freak out. Just prepare and make sure that you're thinking about all of these changes are going to be inflationary and they're going to lead to harder times. They're going to lead to um, not being as free and, and you're not going to have like 10 TVs in a house anymore. You're going to have to start being more practical with your funding, with your finances. So that's that's how you want to be thinking about it. And we'll talk more about it in the show as things go, but that's where your head should be to start being more prepared and less, uh, woohoo. You only live once, uh, YOLO. Uh, go ahead, Doug. <laughs> Wrap it up. Well, I, I think the other issue, and I thought we had a chart for it, but I can't find it right this second is that, you know, unfortunately the, uh, the, no, the percentage of those interest rates against our GDP, um, is, is significantly crossing over. Uh, it's more than we pay for military. Um, so, you know, again, every dollar, so it, our government's in debt. Now we can print money, but the point is still got to pay on it. So if tax revenues and tax receipts are comparable and right now we've had a rise, a, a rolling stock market, a rolling stock market and, and inflationary pricing means more income taxes and more income and more, you know, and more sales taxes and all that. And everybody's feasting off the hog right now. And it's great. That's why people are happy. But at the end of the day, you bring a dollar in and you have a dollar to spend. Okay. Life is good. You bring a dollar in and 10% of it is already gone to inflation or to interest on other things. You only have 90 cents left, but if you still need a dollar to live off of, Guess what? You got to borrow that 10% that you bought, that you took, that you needed to get back to a dollar, which meant, but you only had 90 cents coming in on that dollar. So now guess what? Next month, you're not going to have 90 cents anymore to spend. You have less because you had to borrow more. It's a bad cycle to get in. The other thing is that we're starting to see the, the parts of the world, like the, like the, like Japan and the repo market, they are starting to show signs of weakness that people just don't want to keep trading and holding on to debt. And we still got banks out there that are sitting on massive unrealized losses based on debt, you know, debt that they're holding on to. And again, if they're trying to get the stuff off the books, that drops the pricing. So there really isn't an appetite right now worldwide for the US for US debt, which is, you know, it hasn't been, you know, rebrand repriced on the ratings, but yet but the reality is, is that the United States has relied on the fact that everybody was always happy with U.S. debt because the U.S. will always pay. And I think that part of the another takeaway of all of these alignments and these relationships is you're starting to see less of that stomach and that appetite for believing that the U.S. debt is going to be as safe and secure as it ever has been. And that means less demand for it. Um, and that means that they're going to have a harder time just raising the debt that they're trying to spend on. So it is a cycle. Last thing I want to say on, 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 you mentioned something about tape, you know, don't pay off the mortgage. Saw something the other day. It's just mind blowing. There's a difference. And I've said this before, for those that listen between having debt and being in debt, being in debt is paying for something today with money you don't have. So the only way that you can then pay that off is future income yet to be earned. It's a terrible place to be. It means it's what I talked about. That means every single dollar you now work for is going to be going to pay something off that you had in the past. It's uncomfortable. It's stressful. And unfortunately, it puts you one mistake, one shift away from potentially losing everything. Having debt's different. Having debt means you owe people. 
but you have multiple means to pay it. You could certainly pay it with future income yet to be earned. You could pay it with the principal of money that you already have, or you could just keep your money earning interest on their interest through arbitrage and let that work. But you could always take and pay it off if you want to. I saw some the other day, somebody said, look, well, if you had $500,000 in a 2% mortgage, what would you do that 500,000? And over 60% of people said, I'd take the $500,000, I'd pay off the mortgage right now because then I could start saving. Yeah. You have $500,000 in hand. The instant you give it away to the banks, it's gone. Like people have to understand this. If you have 500,000 here and a $500,000 mortgage, you're not in debt. First of all, the house itself is an asset against that mortgage. You could sell the house, make the 500 work for you and keep it liquid because it gives you those choices, liquidity, use, control, never, all, well, not, never pay off a mortgage or, or a loan that you're paying less interest than the money you're making. If you have enough, you are not in debt if you have more than that. And second of all, always pause and really look at the numbers to figure out again, even if it's not just the interest and the cost, what is the value and peace of mind of liquidity? And if you have, a, if you have that money sitting around, you're not in debt. You have lots of choice and control. And at the end of the day, proper financial planning is about being in control of your money. And we rush too much to give that control away. When you give that money back to the banks and let's say you need money tomorrow, do you think they're just going to hand it back to you? Absolutely not. So don't be so excited to just give your money away for the false peace of calm and, and security. All right. With that being said, talking about that is a great segue to giving your money away. Colleges. The average college is going to cost twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year. That's for state school, and that's also after discounts. Some people are lucky enough to get full ride, okay? But it doesn't happen very often. So the average family at the best is probably looking for four years, around a hundred grand. That's more, that's twice a car, okay? And you're doing that in four years. At least a car you can pay off over six. If you look at a house, you know, $400,000 house, you've got two, three kids, you've got the price of a house in four years. Now, again, the rush. Nobody wants to take on loans. Nobody take, wants to take on debt. Everyone wants to rush to throw their money away. But like I just said, don't be so eager to give your money away and blow your retirement by not having a plan on how to pay for college. There's a lot of things you need to know about getting the price down. There's a lot of different ways you can pay for it that can actually not only protect your retirement, possibly give you a refund for, for, for the college that you're paying, and ultimately maybe even make your retirement better. You want to know anything about this, and, and that's not even touching tax savings and other strategies that most people don't know about. Look us up, mergentcollegeadvisors.com. I'm going to have to give you a graphic because of the spelling, Kirk, so you can put this up now and then. M-E-R-G-E-N-T, M-E-R-G-E-N-T, mergentcollegeadvisors.com. Go get some free information. Start learning now because you have those dollars. Hopefully you have enough, but don't be in a rush to give them away. Awesome. Well, once again, Doug, thanks for coming on and sharing your, your wit and wisdom with us. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us on Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at InnovativeWealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.